here we have a, a pivot table option. Um, I'm just going to show, jump right in and, and create a, a very simple pivot table first. Remember, I don't have any relationships yet. Uh, I could create those manually um, with these buttons, but let's, let's have a little bit more fun than that. Um, I have multiple different options for pivot tables to create. These are a lot of options that I'm not given in, in a vanilla Excel. I can create whole report layouts, like the before chart report layout. But uh, for now, let's just go with a single pivot table. Uh, all visualization, all reporting um, in Power Pivot, at least in the add-in that we, we, we do, all of that is done in Excel. It's all native Excel rendering and calculation of reports. So um, the add-in is not, the add-in is a design tool for the, the underlying database, and it provides some assistance with building your report. But it does not render your report. Power Pivot does not render a pixel of UI to a consumer of a report if that makes sense. Um, but we are going to create the pivot table here in Excel for you. Uh, and we have our own field list. So this field list is part of the add-in. Uh, it's sort of a hybrid between the OLAP field list that you might have seen in Excel before uh, and the what we used to call the native um, uh, field list. It has a few similarities to each. So. Um, one similarity to the OLAP field list is that every single table in my, uh, my data source window is represented here, and every single field is represented, uh, every single column is represented. Um, and you know, for those of you who know Excel, Excel only does one table at a time. And so one of the primary activities of Excel power users uh, in the world today is to use the VLOOKUP function to completely denormalize multiple tables into one. Uh, they won't have to do that anymore uh, with, with Power Pivot. And in early testing with Excel users um, with, with this interface, they've had no trouble with it. It's not, it hasn't forced them to stretch their brains in unnatural directions. They actually really, really like this. Um, so it gives them all of those, but it has some similarities to the native field list in that you'll see there isn't a hint of OLAP terminology here. There's no distinction between measures, dimensions, anything like that. Any of these fields, they're just fields. I can park them anywhere I want. Uh, you know, some, some of these fields, you probably think of them as being the source of a measure. But I can put it on the rows and treat it like a dimension uh, if I want. <laughs> I might not always want to. And likewise, I can take a, uh, a text field, drag it to values, and start getting the count, <coughs> the count of it so I can start treating it as a measure. So let me just show off a couple quick things here. So this, this is my fact table. So let's get. Uh, sales amount. I'm just going to check that. And we inspect the, the data type. And if, if it's a number, we put it in values. And what really happens here behind the scenes is, is two steps. First, we decide, OK, we're gonna, we, we need a sum of sales amount. So it's a number. We default to sum on numbers, just like Excel does. Uh, so we need a sum of sales amount. Um, but that measure doesn't exist in this, in this cube. It actually is a cube, even though it is an analysis services database. I can talk more about that later. Um, so we do two things. The add-in first goes to the, to the cube and says, uh, and actually defines uh, a sum of sales amount measure. So now that does exist in the, in the cube. And then it goes back to Excel and tells Excel to add that measure to the pivot table. And Excel just thinks it's, it's interacting with um, analysis services as if it was the same as, um, you know, AS from five years ago. There's nothing different about the query interfaces. So in this case, really, Excel is not really understanding that it's working with a, a power pivot, uh, pivot table. OK, so that's, that's a measure. We'll just stick with some of the sales amount for now. And let's go to geography table. And let's do, um, uh, let's do, yeah, let's do the English country region name. And I'm going to drag that to row labels. Okay, you see here that it broke it out, and it broke it out. Everyone gets the grand total, and that's because there's no relationship between uh, the geography table and the fact table yet. Uh, the field list tells me, though, that, that there's a relationship missing, so I don't have to just see that, <laughs> that the numbers are bogus. Um, and we have an auto, uh, auto detection feature for creating these relationships, and I've gotten pretty lazy um, with this feature. I've been... Um, trying to break it. Uh, I think I've maybe foiled it once. 
Uh, it even has detected in my data, uh, I'll show you some sports data later, but um, it's detected multiple hops. I've tried to confuse it by giving it tables that it has to go through at least one intermediate table to detect it. Um, that algorithm was developed in conjunction with uh, Microsoft Research, and uh, I think it's been tuned quite a bit even since CTP3. But, so this is one of the challenges out there is see how, um, how many real data sets you have that you can break the auto detect with. Uh, don't just go constructing data sets that, that are difficult, but in terms of reality. Okay, so that, that created the relationship, refreshed the pivot table, and now I am getting different numbers. So uh, that's, that's certainly encouraging. Um, let's see here. Uh, later on, I'll show you creating a, a new explicit measure. Um, but this is called the temperature mashup data uh, demo, and I've only really shown you uh, sales data so far. So what's the mashup thing about? Well, there's a lot of data sources that, I remember it's actually kind of funny, like one of the, the, the only time I met Bill Gates, one of the things he said was that uh, a lot of Excel users are the place where multiple different data sets come together. And he said, I think a lot of the world is like that. Um, and uh, I, I certainly agreed with that at, at the time. Um, in that same presentation he also, uh, that I was involved in, he also swore at me for 45 seconds uh, uninterrupted. Um, so it was a very memorable day all the way around. Um, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's more to that story. It, it actually has a really funny ending. But um, anyway, uh, all those sorts of data sources, like if you're doing a real cube, uh, one of the things is you really kind of have to get all of that data into the data warehouse first. Um, that's sort of a first step. And if I just want to uh, slice out some of my existing data warehouse data by another data source, uh, maybe only do it one time, maybe on an ongoing basis, it doesn't make sense to, to gate me on uh, you know, having to go back to the database, database professionals and, and request additional tables be added from a particular source and things like that. So um, PowerPivot is very good at this sort of um, mix and match of data sources, just like Excel is. So um, I, went, I was sitting here looking at the AdventureWorks data, trying to come up with a good demo one day, and thought, well, what if I had some data about weather, some data about temperature? And this is just a sales, you know, a, a sample sales database. Uh, it's basically like for an, an outdoor equipment they, company. They sell bicycles and things like that. So. How do sales, what, is, what changes about sales behavior and, and purchasing behavior as the temperature changes? So I went to um, the US meteorological site and I grabbed a whole bunch of really nasty CSV data. Um, and then I spent probably 30 minutes cleaning that up in Excel to get into a format that, that worked. Um, and I'll, I'll spare you those steps. Um, but I will bring it up here. So I have it in another Excel workbook. Um, I can go ahead and just uh, copy that. And I could paste it directly into my Power Pivot window and create a new table, but let's, let's show another feature. So you see here on the, um, um, oh, where is it? I've, I've switched builds, so I, I'm having a hard time with it. But anyway. Um, if I go back here, pick another sheet, paste that over, um, I have another button here called Create Linked Table. Uh, and that does the, the paste back into Power Pivot for me in the same workbook um, and adds the table, but also creates a linkage so that uh, if I want to go back uh, to Excel, you know, I, can change, I can change a value to be in E and then flip over and it will, it will flow over. Um, now I don't really need to do that, so <laughs> let's put it back. Um, there are some things that I'll, I'll mention later about this, about this linkage between uh, Excel and Power Pivot. It's really meant, it's not meant to be, this is not the way to do um, ongoing uh, data cleaning. Um, it's meant to be the place that you have um, a list of data that doesn't change very often. So if you, if you imagine a, um, some sort of dimension list that's user maintained, 
um, doesn't change uh, every day. Um, it's a, good, it's a good usage of this because it doesn't, uh, there's no way to auto-refresh this on the server, which there is for other things. But anyway, I added a table here it's called table three. Let's rename it, call it temperature. And you know, now I need to uh, join it in with, um, with the rest of my data. Uh, now let's actually flip over to the pivot table really quick for a second. I want to add a couple of other features. I made a change to the model, so when I refresh, it'll have the, the temperature table at the bottom. Um, have you seen slicers? Raise your hand if you have seen slicers. Uh, have you seen slicers in Power Pivot? Okay, cool. Um, so I've related the geography table and the sales table. Uh, let's do the product table. Um, well, let's, do, um, let's do sales territory first. Uh, so sales territory, where did, hmm, what field did I add before? I did geography. Okay. So, hmm, interesting. I don't know my data as well as I thought I did. Uh, I don't have the demo steps planned out click by click. I'm sort of uh, going informal today. Okay, this is a little bit different than the other one. Um, still need to create a relationship between those two. And let's take um, product or date. Let's do date. That's even better. So English day. We don't have a, I don't think we have a Swedish in here, do we? You see one thing here is that we're automatically laying out slicers for you next to the report. And we, we, we inspect each field um, to see, uh, A, how many unique values is in it. Uh, we also look at sort of the, the 95th percentile of uh, string length. And we, you know, we, we, we give the slicer a, a layout um, that's appropriate. We also have these parent controls that uh, allow you to resize the region. Um, all of that is uh, manual in Excel with slicers. Um, and then there's also this horizontal region that goes across the top and it moves everything down. Let me, I can show that really quick. Day, number of month. So um, let's create all these relationships. Now I know from looking at my data that the temperature table that I brought in, uh, there's no, um, there, aren't, there aren't matching keys uh, to relate it to any of my other tables at this point. Um, so I'm going to show, I'm going to show something we call DAX. Um, we gave it a name because, well, engineers like to have uh, their product that they build have names. We have a whole team, it's probably the biggest team on PowerPivot, working on DAX. And the way I think of DAX is uh, almost that we, we shouldn't have named it, um, in that it's just Excel. It's just the Excel formula language. Uh, in fact, many of the functions um, in DAX literally are the code from Excel. It's a separate calc engine because we, it's embedded in PowerPivot as opposed to in Excel. But the code for the functions was a, a copy-paste of code from Excel. It's like the concatenate function, for instance, is 100% exactly the same. Uh, as it is in Excel. So here I have um, my temperature table. And in the fact internet sales table, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to join fact internet sales to temperature. Um, and just so I don't mess up, I am, I have this cheat sheet with my, my formulas pre-written for today. I do not want to be typing these wrong. Um, and I'll, but I will explain what they do. So. The related, related function uh, is a lot like VLOOKUP for Excel users. But when you have a relationship between two tables, I can just say equals related and give the column from the other table that I want. And it brings those matching values back as a calc column uh, in, this, in this view. So I start typing a formula and say equals related. And we get the same autocomplete that Excel uh, 2007 and 2010 have. 
So related, and the, I, the one column that I want, let's double check, is the dim sales territory, sales territory region. Okay, so dim sales territory. Right. You can see that that also auto completes. And I want to concatenate that. The thing is, my temperature data is broken out by uh, temperature um, per month, by, by month number. Um, so in order to relate that, I'm relating each sales record to the temperature that was recorded in that region where the, uh, where the sale took place. So I, I go ahead and concatenate that with, um, again, related. And this time it is, I believe it's from the date table. Dim date, month, number of year. Date. Okay. And if I haven't made any mistakes, this will add a column to that table. And then because of a bug in CTP3, it automatically shoots me over to the left edge of the table. Okay. Um, so here's my calculated column. I'm just going to call, I'm going to rename this, call it, uh, I don't know, temp region key. Right. Now, when I added this calculated column, the size of the database actually increased. This is something to, to think about when you're working with Power Pivot. Some things you do increase the size of the database. So these values are materialized and persisted. And until the next time I make a change that forces a recalc for some reason, those formulas will never be evaluated again. They'll just be stamped in the database as if they came from another source as an import. Um, when you d define measures, obviously, measures don't um, persist values uh, like calculated columns do. So we go back to temperature. You see that I have region and I have month number. So I need to do the same sort of thing. So I need to say equals, um, oops, I hit enter somehow. All right equals uh, region concatenated with uh, month number. Okay, let's double check that that looks right. Yep, looks right to me. So let's go ahead and go back to the pivot table. Oops. And <clears throat> let's add something. Let's add from temperature. Let's actually get rid of um, English day name real quick. Let's add temperature, some temperature data to the, so average temperature is the average temperature for that month in that particular region. Um, by the way, I went to the US meteorological site for US regions and then I had to go to other sources on the web for a few other places outside the US. Let's take average temperature and put that on the vertical slicers. Create the relationship. Okay. So now, I mean, if, if you imagine the AdventureWorks data being my real sales data, what I've just done is completely realistic. I mean, I, I went to the internet sites myself, I grabbed the, grabbed the data, um, and now I'm, I'm slicing my, my sales amounts by temperature. Of course, this is way too fine-grained. <laughs> um, it's not, not quite what I want. Um, and the way to do grouping of things like this in, in Power Pivot is to uh, add another calculated column. So go back over here and uh, let's see here. So I'm going to apply a temperature range to each um, to each row, and that's just a really simple nested if. Um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, uh, but Excel users do things way worse than this. Um, this is this is still all on one line. Um, and after a while, it's kind of like in the movie The Matrix, Excel users look at this and they just see a case statement. Um, I still very badly wish we had a case statement in Excel, but we, we don't yet. But anyway, based on different uh, thresholds, it's going to assign um, cold, cool, warm, and hot. Okay. 
go back over to Excel. Let's get rid of let's get rid of average temp. We don't want that. We want oh <laughs> I haven't renamed it. Um, let's just go ahead and use it anyway. Okay, so now I've got something that I can actually work with. So um, you know different different countries. I can I can flip through. I'm still not really seeing anything that tells me sort of at a glance uh, what I want. I mean, uh, one problem, of course, is formatting. Um, I don't need three decimal places, and I certainly would, would like some, some commas in there. Um, is it a comma separator here, or is it is comma the, the, uh, the decimal separator? Comma is the decimal separator. Okay. Well, I want commas. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I'm not really seeing uh, whether, I mean, there might just be more warm days in certain places than others. So some of the sales amount doesn't really tell me about the performance of my products, uh, the performance of my business. And this is where uh, the other half of DAX comes in. So in, in this window, I'm showing you DAX calculated columns. And very, very important. But DAX measures is the other half. And you know, me personally, from an Excel user's point of view, DAX measures are, the, are probably the most exciting thing uh, coming along here. Um, I will show you what that looks like. <clears throat> Let's add a new measure. What I really want to have is the, uh, the sales quantity per day. That's what I want to see. I want to see if, I, if my products sell better on cold days, warm days, cool days, things like that. Um, so here on the Power Pivot ribbon, the new measure. Uh, and here is um, the UI for creating, uh, creating measures. But I'm going to stop here for just a second and give you a little bit of information. There's sort of like uh, a handful of small rules to learn. And once you've learned those, everything else about DAX is very, well, at least incremental. Most of it's easy. There are a couple places that are, are actually kind of tricky. Um, but at least it's incremental for um, once you know these rules. Uh, you might be a little lost until you know these rules. So let's go back over. Oops, <laughs> wrong, wrong window. Okay, so it asks you, that UI asks you for what I call a home table. And for database pros, you should just think of that as the fact table. It's the table where the numerical column, or maybe not numerical column, but it's the, it's the table where the columns that you're going to be aggregating lives. Uh, it needs to know uh, that table. That's sort of the context that the that the measure executes in. Um, when you're writing DAX, you can't just put the, like the quantity field in your DAX formula. You always have to have an aggregation. So sum, average, count, max, something. There's actually a whole bunch of new aggregation functions that, that DAX adds as well. Um, later, you can actually, once you've defined some measures, you can then use measures uh, to define other measures. So uh, the sum of two measures is legal. You don't have to, you can have measure one plus measure two, that's fine. You don't have to wrap measures in aggregation functions because they, they're already aggregations. Um, now this was perhaps uh, the biggest departure from MDX. Now I don't really know MDX all that well, so um, forgive me if I, if I miss this, but when you're thinking about how DAX is calculating its measure, you should not be thinking about the pivot table uh, as the place where the calculation is happening. You should not be thinking about some hierarchical dimensional space uh, as where the calculation is happening. You should think about the source tables back in the Power Pivot window. That's what the measures are operating against. Um, and then it's a two-phase calc process. The first is where we filter. So we take those source tables and we sort of narrow those down to just the records that match the current context. And I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Um, and then once we have our, our filtered tables, then we perform aggregations against those, uh, as if those were the only records in the world. Uh, and we do that sort of cell by cell. Like if you think in the pivot table, each intersection of dimensions uh, and measures, um, we go cell by cell. Now we, we really, for performance reasons, we, we optimize quite a bit. Uh, we don't really go cell by cell. But in terms of how you're thinking about it, understand it to, as if it was proceeding cell by cell. Um, and then one last important gotcha <laughs> that I missed when I was first doing this stuff was that when we're filtering, those filters flow down from the one side of a relationship to the many side. 
they never flow back up from the many to the one. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of that a little bit later. Um, now I have a, uh, a little bit of a short um, movie that uh, I built it in PowerPoint, but uh, I left the US and turned off my computer and left the PowerPoint uh, on my desktop computer. So here's the YouTube version downloaded as an MP4, and I skipped ahead. Um, and I'll sort of explain what's happening at each step. So I just show a little bit of a picture, and the resolution's not great, but it's a pivot table with two slicers uh, and products on rows, uh, and then the sum of order quantity as the measure. And calendar year and temperature range are the slicers. Um, and then, let's see here, it's not, it's not the space bar, it's the play button. Um, so then the table that it's operating against is, um, is the sales table. And uh, there that is. Um, and then remember, we're going to go sell by sell to perform our filter. Filter is the first, the first half. So we're going to go look at this cell first. In the pivot. Pretend we're, the measure is going to calculate that cell uh, individually, which again, it, it, it sort of does everything all at once. But assume that it's doing that. And we, we take the filters that are applied to that one cell. Um, so if my, you know, my, my movie self stops moving the mouse, um, we'll see that, come on, come on, Rob. There we go. So accessories is one of those filters. Um, we take that filter and we apply it um, back to our source table. Um, and then we have these other two. Come on, skip ahead. I apologize for this, folks. OK, there we go. So um, this is the, uh, that's the accessories category. This is the accessories table. So basically, we're saying we're going to we'll take that filter. We use it to filter the accessories table behind the scenes, just down to matching the, sorry, the uh, product category table. We filter it down to ju just to the records, well, really to the one record that's the accessories category. And then that filter, because it follows the relationship, from the one to the many, we'll then filter this table. It filters our fact table. We, we lose records as a result of that filter flowing down. All right, so we have, we've lost records that don't match accessories. That, does that make sense so far? Have I lost? How many of you have I lost so far? <laughs> huh? That's, that's nervous laughter. Uh, can someone who was laughing speak for the, the laughing audience and tell me what I need to fill in? No? It's, it's a tough one to, to be the person saying, Rob, you've done a bad job explaining this. All right, I'm just going to assume that everyone's following that. We'll do it again, because we've got a couple other filters to go. And I'm going to be smart this time and just zap ahead. So we take this warm selection from the temperature range slicer. That's actually another coordinate of this cell. Uh, we take that through the temperature table, and we only select rows that are warm. We filter the rest of them out, just like they don't exist anymore for the purposes of this calc. We bring that over, and that, again, follows a relationship, comes down here to the fact table, and we get more rows that we lose. We just keep filtering down our row set. So we have multiple dimension tables. You can think of them as dimension tables that are filtered behind the scenes. And our fact table is constantly getting whittled down as well. Take the last one from the calendar year. This calendar year from the date table um, set to 2003 by the user. So again, only 2003 records from the date table will remain alive. And only corresponding records from the fact table will remain alive. And then we will perform an aggregation. Let's see here. On this remaining table, so like sum of order quantity, for instance, if that's your formula for your measure, then it will only be uh, aggregating against the rows that are left. So that's the two-phase pass. We filter the source tables, and then we, then we perform the aggregations against them. So, the, so like the filter is implied in the formula. You know, I think it's probably also true in MDX. That's a little bit new for Excel users. But the filter from the pivot table is applied, implied in the formula, and then we take the formula and apply it against, against what's left. Did that get any better? For the people who are laughing, a couple of nods. All right. All 
All right. <clears throat> so let's go back to Excel and show it. Uh oh. Oh. Is it because I left the window up? Have I found another bug? There we go. Interesting. Um, OK, so the table name, the home table, where my, where my facts are, that's not temperature. That's fact internet sales. I set that. I can name this measure. We're going to call it quantity per day. Um, and <clears throat> so it needs to be a ratio. And uh, so certainly it's um, sum of. Uh, I, can, I can just use the uh, column name uh, without the table name because I know that I'm in the uh, fact internet sales table. But there are other functions that uh, even in measures require this. So in general, I've gotten in the habit of fully qualifying when I'm in measures anyway, um, my, uh, my column name. So this is, uh, is it sales quantity. Let's go back to my formula cheat sheet. Sum of order quantity. Yep. Okay. It's the sum of order quantity. Uh, and then we need to get the number of days uh, that are involved in each cell. And remember, um, we're not the um, we're not actually um, filtering necessarily the days table. Um, because our other filters are flowing down to the fact table, but we do not flow back up. This is, this is a mistake you've got to be careful about. This is the, probably the, the number one thing to be careful about in DAX is that um, tables that are not involved, directly involved in the filtering process uh, do, not get, um, do not get filtered during the filter phase. And in fact, you know, if I filter by um, uh, a field, in that table. So let's say I filter to um, uh, day number of month equals one. So I only want the first day of every month. Um, but then I, later on, I filter to just warm days in another table. Uh, you might think that that's further reduced the number of days that are selected in the date table. It does not. So each table filters itself and then maybe goes down, downstream, never goes back upstream. So if I just take this, the count of rows in the days table, and the date table, uh, I'm going to get the grand total in my, uh, in my denominator. So what I can do, though, is I can do a, um, I can do a distinct count. Actually, let's do count rows. Count rows is a great function uh, if you're an Excel person. I've always had to find some sort of column that I knew was unique uh, and take account of that. So now I can just do count rows. And then distinct is a function that creates, uh, there's a number of functions that create sort of virtual tables behind the scenes. So distinct creates a, uh, a single column table of just the distinct values um, of the things found in that column. So uh, the distinct of the, I believe it's the order date key. So it's your fact internet sales. Yeah. Oh, you know, and I only have um, as many dates uh, involved in this pivot as, you know, as I have unique date keys left after that filtering process. Um, now I'm positive I've lost some people at this point. Yes? OK, everyone's got it. Good. OK, let's check the formula, see if it's OK. I must not have closed my uh, parentheses. Yep, let's try that. All right, so I got quantity per day. Let's give that a better, um, uh, better number format. And remove the sum of sales amount measure. And now when I filter, I can see the performance of my, of my sales uh, in an apples to apples sort of comparison. Uh, and I did all of this. I mean, maybe it, maybe it was a little confusing at times, but uh, 
I did all of this with a skill set that, um, that I've been able to teach uh, in less than an hour to the average Excel uh, power user that builds reports like this today. Um, so that is probably, how are we doing time-wise? Is this a good time for, a, for our first break? Let me check the outside. Okay. Um, someone please ask me a question at this point while he's, uh, while he's doing that. Yes, in the back. So, so can I do multi-column keys? Uh, no, uh, you cannot do multi-column keys in, in, uh, in Power Pivot. You have to do this concatenation trick like what I did. Um, and uh, the good news there is that Excel users, for purposes of VLOOKUP, have been used to concatenating to create you know, sort of composite uh, key columns um, from the beginning of spreadsheeting. So um, it's certainly not a new trick to me, but yeah, you, don't, you cannot do uh, multi-column. Uh, a couple other things about relationships. First of all, um, there can only be one path in Power Pivot between any two tables. So you can't use like the date table uh, twice. Like you can't use it as both a, like a sales date dimension and like a ship date dimension. Um, and the reason we made that decision was we didn't want Power Pivot users to have to uh, name their relationships. Um, it didn't really make sense to have them putting the name of a relationship in a formula saying, okay, I want to traverse this relationship um, rather than that one. So it's a, it's a simplification thing. So if you need to use a, a date table for multiple purposes, you import it twice. That's the, that's the trade-off with Power Pivot. And lastly, uh, as far as relationships go, uh, there are no many-to-many -many dimensions in Power Pivot, not in V1 anyway. Yes, question. Um, so doing all this in memory, what if we have a large database? Um, so we w went to great lengths with the compression scheme to make sure that your data will fit in RAM. Um, now I do recommend the 64-bit version of, the, of Excel 2010 and the 64-bit add-in because the amount of RAM um, that's available to you is much better. But um, the compression that we get on a database uh, is pretty impressive, especially uh, the larger the database gets, the, you know, the, the higher our compression ratio gets. Uh, and that compression uh, remains, like the database remains compressed uh, in RAM while we're working with it. We don't, we, we partially decompress it because we get some file compression as, you know, on the disk as well. But um, the majority of our compression uh, is preserved in RAM and it actually helps us uh, at query time as well. But we were able to perform uh, scans for which rows should be included and, and not included um, and you know, leverage that compression. So um, when you run out of RAM, uh, I do not believe that we have um, a swapping mechanism. We don't, we, don't, we don't really do paging. I mean, other than what the OS gives us. Um, but uh, I have yet to uh, personally hit the limit when I'm running 64-bit. Um, we, I've seen compression as high as 15x in, uh, in my data sets. It's variable based on data set, and there's some, there's some guides on how to um, uh, make your data more compressible. Um, but I don't know if that's answered your question. Well, it's it's, uh, well, we, we, when we started out with this, we, we were calling it, before we called it VertiPack, we were calling it the in-memory uh, BI engine. We were calling it MB. Um, so it is very much, I'm not, I'm not one of the engine folks on the team, so I'll have to come back with some more details for you. But um, it, is, it is all designed for in-memory, and we have, a, we have a file size limit of two gigabytes um, on disk, because that's the, that's the file size limit of SharePoint. But within that two gigabyte uh, file size, uh, we've been able to pack like, uh, at, at times 15, 20x uh, that amount of data that was in the original database into that, uh, into that two gig. So if you've got something larger than you know, 30, 40 gigs, um, then it, you know, it might not fit in uh, our, our, even if you had enough RAM, because we limit the file size at two gigabytes. 
Yes, in the back. So do we do data quality issues like when we're creating relationships and things like that? And uh, the answer is that PowerPivot is not remotely uh, an ETL or a data cleaning tool. Um, I didn't mention it, I should have, that this, other than adding calculated columns, this entire canvas is read-only. I can't, I can't edit in here, I can't add new rows, I can't delete rows. So this is one of the keys to um, the data quality coming into this is perhaps even more important uh, than it is today. Because uh, I, as a user, I don't have a mechanism for cleaning it. Uh, the, the investment in making a cleaning tool uh, that users could, could operate with and, and be 100% uh, is that's, that's a massive undertaking. And I'm not sure that we ever will. Um, Uh, well, if, if, you're, if you actually have serious referential integrity issues, then the relationship can't be created. It's, it doesn't, um, I mean, we can have, um, uh, you know, nulls, essentially. Um, you know, not every row in your date table needs to have a corresponding sale in the fact table. Um, but, uh, I mean, you, you cannot, it, it does double check that the relationship is valid uh, before it persists it. 